our Father in heaven. That talks to the fact that it says, Abba or Dad, the language is used. So it's, it's an invitation to intimacy with God. And then we go on to say, uh, Hallowed be your name, I'm going to repeat it. The, and it's, it is asking that God's name and reputation would be enhanced. So honouring God uh, is one of the aspects of the Lord's Prayer. It prays for God's will to be done. It longs for uh, our present experience to be even more like his intention and what heaven will be, like his intention for earth, even beforehand. So we pray for God's will to be done. It prays for provision. In this, uh, in the, the prayer, it just says, give us the food we need. Uh, most of us are probably not wondering what we'll have for lunch. You may be wondering where you'll we'll have lunch or what the leftovers will be, but probably not is there food to eat at all. That's probably not on your agenda. So, provision. Then there's repentance and forgiveness. Forgive us our sins in the same way and literally to the same extent as we forgive others. That's the one I struggle with because I want God to forgive me a whole lot better than I forgive others. What about you? Um, and then it plays for protection. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. So it's a, it's a recognition that we need more than our own strength. So what I'd like to do today is I want to give you uh, about one minute. This is silent prayer, so I just want you to pray quietly to yourself. And I'm going to give you one minute, and I want you to choose one of those areas that are meaningful you or meaningful for you, or is your need for today. Whether it's intimacy with God, whether it's honouring God, whether it's seeking His will or longing for it to be done. Maybe there's provision. That could be about health. It could be about uh, just help. It could be about a lot of different things. Finances. Uh, maybe food. Or maybe you realise you've allowed uh, some stuff to build up and you're a bit ticked off with a few people it's time to let that go. Or maybe you're struggling with areas uh, and you're asking for God to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave you to pray for about one minute, what touches your life out of the Lord's prayer. Then, I'll let you know what's happening. We're going to change the channel, so to speak. And I want you to choose one of those areas and pray that for someone else. So that we are actually not just, prayer is not just about God doing what I need in my life or in our church. I want us to why. Now you might pray for someone in this room, you might pray for someone in your family, you might pray for someone in the community. So is that clear? A minute praying for out of one of those areas, you don't have to do them all, then about a minute praying for someone else in what area we be. And just make a series of ideas. A few new people who have been here before, there's a few people that have returned from some wonderful holidays, I see at the back. More of us have been Lord Howe Island, so it's perfect apparently, so that's great. Um, yeah, so welcome to our service here this morning. Um, just a reminder, everyone's aware of the COVID, so we're still seeing as we are, and the 1.5 rule still applies. Um, and we're not looking morning to either this morning, but I'd like to invite you next Sunday after church to come and break bread together. <laughs> Now, I listened to the sermon last week, and so I thought, I'd take that as a bit of a challenge amongst others to ask, invite people to break bread together. So we're going to have a picnic after church, is the simple terminology that I use. Um, picnic after church at Bongo Bongo. Um, so yeah, bring a picnic lunch, and we'll, we'll meet together and break bread together. So that would be great. Um, there's a couple of things that are starting up again, or some things that are continuing in the school term, one of which is uh, a men's group, uh, which is something that's been going for a while, and Jimmy Morrison's um, going to start one here at the church on the 2nd of May, which is a Sunday evening, and they're going to be at 6.30pm, and he just sent out a bit of a text last night, a gentleman, you've probably got it, um, if you could have numbers to know how many resource books he's going to get. It's Louis Giglio's book, The Life Must Fall. Um, so if you could just return, um, message him, that would be great. And do it all at once, just to 
Yeah. 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 But um, yeah, if you're involved in that, just check the basket. Apparently, there's always goodies in there for people, so that's great. And um, just uh, keep keep in mind praying for each other there. That's great, it's a great thing to see. Also, starting up is our youth program, which will start not the first Friday of term, but the next Friday. But there is a leaders' meeting on that Friday. That's at our house, so everyone who's involved with that it will be at six pm, and um, dinner will be provided. Have you? You know about that, yes? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's now. That's now. So yeah, um, just sitting and be praying for all those things that are happening. The one thing um, we didn't mention at Easter time, but we are going to do is this crossover offering. Now crossover, for those of you who don't know, is um, it's a national initiative of Australian Baptist Ministries, um, which is committed to, and this is reading off the website, Resourcing churches in effective communication with gospel, equipping pastors and leaders, and facilitating mission. They do heaps of different stuff, and we're going to show you some videos in the coming weeks of what they do, and we will be taking an offering in a few weeks' time. So you won't forget it because we'll be putting some videos in, in front of you to, as a reminder, and just to see what they do. It's really good stuff. And the last thing I've got to mention is there's a a bit of a hand out there on the front table. Can you help Andrew? Andrew Bate is continuing with his theological studies and he's asked for a bit of assistance um, in, by means of a survey. So if we could complete a survey for him now, there's a website there and it's on the subject of mission. So if you can take one of those sheets and it's an anonymous uh, survey, they don't have to put your name in or anything, and um, just go to that website and you can fill out the just assume there'll be questions to yeah. All right, that's all. So we start on the, this is called the Foundation of Prayer. This is the second in a series that we just started last week called When Christianity Confronts Culture. And we talked about that Christianity would confront every culture. It'll confront it at different spots, but there's something about living the way God wants us to live that is not normal or natural for us. Now, often when we see a title like that, when Christianity confronts culture, we go, great, we can impact the culture around us. And that's part of it. But the reality is, sometimes, dare I say often, Christianity has to confront our culture so that we actually live the way that God wants us to live. And that's part of what we're doing today. So I'm going to go, how do you not start a prayer, a sermon on prayer by praying. So let me invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we, uh, we talk about a topic that's been talked about for 2,000 years and more longer than that. Prayer has been around in so many forms. And there's part of it, we've either wrestled with it, we've succeeded or we've failed, or we've, all those different things for so long, it's easy for us to assume we know and we know stuff, but we don't know what your spirit wants to do in our lives today. That's yet to be discovered. And so we choose today to go on that journey of discovery. We hope that by the end of uh, this service or this, this sermon, that we will have heard your voice and we will know how this applies to each of our lives rather than just be a package of truth. <coughs> And we just recognize that when you said that the, the worship that you want is worship in spirit and in truth, that we can do our part, but we need your spirit to empower the words I speak and the way our hearts receive them. So may your name be glorified. May we and the Dwight Church be strengthened because of this. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we, we looked at. Uh, <coughs> Uh, last week we looked at the, the topic of devotion to Christ and the Lordship of Christ. Can we have the next slide, please? And we use this, uh, we, we unpack a little bit 
what they would have voted to, this comes out of Acts chapter 2, and that the early church it says that they voted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread. Um, and read into that if you're not used to the leading of that broken group. Uh, and prayer. And so I want to take prayer out as, as part of it. And so let's focus on that. And I'll talk about, and when we create a culture, there are some things that are absolutely foundational in that. And the Lordship of Christ is foundational. Not optional. It's not part of the options pack like when you buy a new car, you can have it or you can not. It's, it's essential. And I believe that prayer is also essential. I think it's one of the foundations that any healthy church, any God-honoring church is committed to. It's easier to say that than do that. Is that right? Okay. So, let me talk about foundations for a little bit. Foundations are important. This is uh, two years ago, staring at the, the foundations of our house. And some of you, you went to our house, they asked Alvin, and my, what is my standard answer? Slowly. That's right. And I speak the truth. But two years ago, that's where it was at. We'll bring up the next slide. So foundations are important. <coughs> um, and in my notes I put, and expensive. Uh, we had, by the time the whole slab for that house, we had 20 cement trucks that arrived on that day with over 100 cubic metres of concrete. I think it constitutes the single largest expense in the entire building project. There were a few other that competed with it, but it was it was very, uh, very expensive to get something about this far out of the ground. So foundations aren't important, but we go to the next, this is, this is one stage. So, you see that little white bit down the bottom? That's what we paid all the money for. That was the foundation. But because we had the foundation was done well, we were able to build upon it and uh, bring the, the next slide up as well. So that's where we're at at the moment. The left-hand side is completed. That's a squashed down Photoshop image that doesn't look nearly as big on the photo as the outside. Uh, that's where we're up to. Um, and we were working on that on Thursday, Guy and I, as we uh, went there. But I want to talk about the, the whole concept, the one of the concepts of building, when now the ridge, the ridge of that house is seven and a half metres off the ground. Um, and, uh, and you've got to actually tie from the very top, the very highest point, gets actually tied through and bolted to the foundation. I need a a couple of volunteers, thanks, please. Quite <laughs> <laughs> okay. be embarrassing. Uh, I'll get your dad to do something with this So hold that up, just take a quick, just run that down that aisle so that people can see, come up this aisle. So that's one of the bolts. I think there's about $500 worth of those. There are just, every time I go, I've got to buy more bolts. Uh, some of them an in depth look at that. Keep it done, keep it done. There you go, sir. Come on down, Jim. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is like a quick look. So there's, there's just masses of bolts there, 12 mil galvanized bolts for the builders around us. Um, but you know when yeah, just slow down, I'll have my bolt back. Because they have to count how many I need. Um, so you've got to try and tie that down. But you know that in the movie Crocodile Dundee, the guy pulls out and, and Linda Koslowski says, He's got a knife. What's mixed response? That's not a knife. Well, Joe. Right. Because uh, I showed you the little box. If you want to take, and without skewering anyone, just do the same way. Uh, and you can have a look. Uh, because part of what my engineer has said is that I've got to have bolts that actually, I can't buy them long enough. I have to extend those bolts because they go into the concrete foundation. They go up through the walls, they get bolted to the walls with all these other things and triple groups. And then the fun jobs that the guy and I have been doing at times and others is from the top of the walls, we then start climbing up on top of the roof and scrapping it down with metal straps and this ridiculous stuff. I think my house may not get termites, but it could rust. Uh, that's my worry. Um, now, all that to say, thank you, don't lose that, but I need that one as well. The concept is 
you need to tie any structure. If you want your structure to grow high, if you want your, uh, you need what we're talking about, you need to tie it to a foundation. If we expect our church to grow, if we expect to see not just numerical growth, but if we expect to grow as individuals, if we expect to grow in the ability to minister and impact our community, we need for that growth to be stable, to tie it down to a foundation. So that's one of the reasons why second in this series on, on culture is to say prayer is the foundation upon which anything of any real value will be built. Our aim is not just to pray and pray and say, that's not it. But we pray because it is an essential foundation. Let's bring up the next slide. So the foundation of prayer. Let me tell you what now, prayer is not the most important thing you can do, okay? Uh, it's important, don't get me wrong. Prayer is not the most important thing you can do because when Jesus was asked what was the most important commandment, he, he had an answer straight away, wasn't he? He said, you've got to love God. You've got to love God with everything you've got, which I would call being devoted to Christ. We talked about that last week. So this loving God, and then he says, love other people, that's the second most. Those two things, he then turned around to the people who were experts, they were like university uh, lecturers in religious law, and he said, if you love God and you love other people, you have fulfilled all the, the law and the prophets. Wow. They both got redundant. Given their life to teaching, they said, all you've got to do is learn that. So prayer is not the most important thing. Loving God is the most important thing, but this is what I'd like to say. Prayer is an essential pathway to intimacy with Jesus Christ. So it's not the most important thing. A foundation, I didn't dream of having a concrete slab that stood about a foot out of the ground. That's not the great desire of our lives. But we couldn't build the house we want to build without a foundation. And prayer, we don't pray for the sake of praying. That's just religion. And we don't pray because we enjoy prayer. Some people do, that's great. Some people don't. We don't pray because it's our personal enjoyment. We pray because in the absence of prayer, we can never have the relationship with Jesus that he intended. We can never follow him the way he directs. We, can, we never rely on him the way he wants us to rely on him. Prayer is an essential pathway to intimacy with Jesus Christ, loving God, which is the most important thing. So, but then we get to ask the question of what type of prayer and I realised as I've done this, there's going to be a couple of typos further on. Uh, and I didn't, I forgot to, to do the changes. <laughs> See, when we come, yeah, that's it. I'll try and pay. Let's pay you here. Um, the people, these people who, that says they devoted themselves to prayer, so that's where we're coming out of. They knew how to pray. Prayer was already part of their lives. Okay? They, most of the people who became Christians on the day of Pentecost, which Acts chapter 2 follows, this is directly linked to, they were in Jerusalem because they were either Jews who knew how to pray, they were either Jews from around other countries who had travelled in, so they knew how to pray, or they were what they called God fearers, which were people who wanted to learn how to be and how to worship the God of Israel. That all of these people knew how to pray. So prayer was familiar to them. And I'm sure that when it talks about the apostles' teaching, that in some of those early meetings, they would have related what we said together today, which was the Lord's Prayer. Remember that? And you remember the setting for the Lord's Prayer? His own disciples. Jews all their life who have been surrounded by prayer, who knew how to pray, but they saw something in the way that Jesus prayed that caused them to go, we don't even, we're not even scratching the surface. 
We know how to pray, but when you pray, things happen. People get filled. Things become clear. There's this amazing stuff. And so these people who knew how to pray, who many of them, if they were older than Jesus, who prayed along with Jesus, they came to him and said, will you teach us to pray like you pray? And he gave them that formula in one sense that we call the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, pray like this. And I think it's more than just repeating the exact words. So I don't think one, we have to pray it in Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus would have spoken. I don't think we need to pray it in Greek, which was the language that they wrote down in the New Testament. I don't think we need to do it in Latin, which for about 1,500 years is how people would have learned. And not to shock anyone, I don't think we need to do it in the King James Version. Although, my brain remembers the right way. Is that right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's how we just remember us, which is not a bad thing. But what I'm saying is, when they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and they taught what Jesus had taught on prayer, they didn't learn a new formula. In fact, if we uh, turn to the passage in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer, let me read to you a few, few verses beforehand. And then this chapter <clears throat> basically turns around and Jesus says, when you give, when you fast, when you pray, there, there are three things that Jesus expected his followers to do. And we're doing pretty good on two out of three. Is that right? That is not great on fasting. And by the way, if you fast without prayer, that's just dieting. Okay? <laughs> it's not particularly spiritual unless it's directly linked to, to God telling you to do that. He says, and when you pray, do not pray like the hypocrites, because they love to stand out in the synagogues and on the streets so that they can be seen by everyone. I tell you the truth, they've all received, already received their reward in full. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who's in heaven. Now, that's not saying we shouldn't pray the Lord's Prayer, or we shouldn't pray together, or we shouldn't pray publicly. But what it is saying is that we shouldn't pray so that we get the glory. Prayer is not about that. You'd be better off to do it secretly than to pray for the wrong reason. But it says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. In, in another version it says, um, they think they'll be heard just because they say the same thing over and over again. Which is interesting, isn't it, when we come to how has the Lord's Prayer evolved into our culture? <coughs> I timed myself a few months ago. I, I thought of having a comp competition to see who could say the Lord's Prayer in the shortest amount of time. I think um, Tim Wilson at the moment claims that victory because he took it away as a challenge. But I mean, I, you can do it in about 30 seconds. You can run it through it. And have you done something spiritual? Or well, maybe. But I'm a bit doubtful. Because anything you can say in exactly the same way in 30 seconds straight without engaging your emotions, I think actually moves beyond the instruction on it. It says, don't, don't babble on like the players, just saying words for the sake of saying words. And the irony is that the way he taught us to pray has now been corrupted to become the very thing that he said, don't do that. So I want you, and I want to challenge you, I want you to pray the Lord's Prayer because it's rich and it's incredible and it's powerful. But don't just let it become roll off the tongue a job I've done. Take it and embrace it. Like we did this morning, it talks about intimacy with God. Let it cry out for you to have a deep relationship with God the Father. Let it lead you into saying, I'm yearning for you all will be done. Because that's the best way for us and for whole society. And if your will is going to be done, then we're probably going to need to be people who ask what your will is and seek to hear your voice. 
The Lord's Prayer is very challenging. It only becomes safe if you pray it in what the Bible says like pagans do. If you let it become religious, just say it for the sake of saying it. I've done my job. Well, you're probably better off learning it in Greek, Latin, or Aramaic. And just saying the words. And there are many religions who for them prayer, they don't even speak the language they know. They speak either in Latin or in Arabic, or they don't know the words they're saying, but they've learned how to say the words. So anyway. What type of prayer? So let's bring up the next slide. And I'm using the, uh, as we did this morning, uh, I'm using the Lord's Prayer to say if it's not actually just saying the exact words, what would they have learned when the apostles said, let's break this down? When Jesus taught us to pray, he would talk about a prayer when it talks about our Father. And as I've said, the prayer, the kind of prayer that I want to see. And hopefully you want to see at the heart of our culture as a church is prayer that is relational and intimate, both with God and with other people. Because the Lord's Prayer, first of all, says, I want you to view not religion, but relationship like a family. So much so you get called God Daddy. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? So the type of prayer we want is relational and intimate. It's God honoring. May your name be honored. Hallowed be your name. Uh, it, that phrase actually has the yearning. We want to enhance your reputation in the eyes of other people. And so if our prayer is like that, I think we're on track. Seeking and surrender to God's will. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and as I said before, that means that we need to be people who listen to God. Ask him about what, what is it? Not only is this what you want to happen, is this the timing to do that? Because a lot of people will listen to what God wants done and then run off in our own timing. And so we need to become the people who listen. Dependent on God's provision. I mentioned that earlier this morning. I want to ask, I, I doubt there will be many times in the life of our church where we will be praying that we have enough food. Maybe if there's a catering disaster, maybe next week at Bongo Bongo Reserve, if you, you know, someone comes, you know, hopefully we'll have enough to share around. That's usually our issue, isn't it? Um, the, the, but what's the provision we need? Maybe it's when we look at our church budget and say, we need to do this, this, and this, but we need to go to the Bible. Or maybe it's we look at the volunteers that are available to run a ministry that we feel that God has called us to do. And we can't see how that can ever happen. And we don't want to burn people out. But so we call that God, would you provide workers? Would you provide people who are willing? Would you provide people who are gifted? Repentance to God and forgiving of others. Forgive us our sins in the same way and to the same extent. Yet, yeah, don't point and don't name people. Have you ever been part of a church? Obviously, not this church. Uh, where people have been out of sorts with one another, and there's been discontent and resentment and unforgiveness, and we kind of treat it that's the way church should be. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe it's just a stopping place on a journey of reconciliation. I'm not saying it's wrong to have those emotions. I am probably saying it's wrong, it's unhelpful to be trapped in those emotions. And the Lord's Prayer literally says, I want you to forgive me in the way that I forgive other people. So there's that reason. The other thing is, are we a church and will we be the kind of church that pretends everything's great? Or will we be the kind of church that comes and says, you know, Lord, we didn't do great on this. We didn't do fantastic in this year. We haven't done this, and we repent of that. We come back to your mercy and grace as a group of people as well as individuals. That's the kind of culture. Committed to holy living. Lead us not into temptation. Let us live lives is the heart of that prayer that brings honour to God. Will we always get it right? Probably not. 
Should we stop trying because we can't get 100% in the test? Definitely not. Does that make sense? So there's a cry. And faith filled, courageous, and expectant. I probably stretched it a little bit. Because the phrase that I've drawn that out is protect us from the evil one. Do you know the best way to be protected from Satan? Or, no, not the best way, an effective way. Don't be a threat to him. Stay low, stay out of sight, don't do anything that would draw his attention. You probably won't get that hard a time from him. You stand up, you take a stand for the gospel. You take a stand for your marriage, for your family, for what's right in society. And you will need protection from Satan. Is that right? Have you ever taken a stand at work or in your family? And the phrase is an old girl breaks loose. It's a reality, isn't it? So when these people were praying, God, lead us not into temptation, and protect us from the evil one. And if you read the book of Acts, they need that protection. Because every time they got threatened, that if you don't stop preaching the gospel, we'll whip you, we'll flog you, we'll put you in prison. You know what they did? They went and prayed for greater boldness, greater opportunities. And I think that's the heart of what arises out of this type of prayer culture. It gives us the faith and the courage to step out and do what sometimes might be seen as uh, crazy. But if it's God directed, it's not. And expect it. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and hell itself will not stop happening. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I like it. Um, it's actually the King James version that puts it that way. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Other versions say it won't overcome it. But you've got to just think for a moment. <clears throat> As Jesus portrays the church, the image of the church is where? In a cathedral? Uh -huh. It's at the gates of heaven. And we treat ourselves sometimes like a defense force instead of a rampaging army. But the image that Jesus had was his church would take down the strongholds of hell in his name. Do we need protection? Amen. Do we need to be expecting good things? Yeah. And in my experience, and again, not in this church, I'm serious about this church, but I've, I've met some people who've been in church situations long enough to realise that there are two spiritual gifts that I refuse to accept. And one is the gift of misinterpretation, and the other one is the gift of discouragement. And I'm going, no, they're not in God's arsenal. But I think they are in Satan's arsenal. And it seems that I've heard some of the most safest players say, don't risk language in church. One of the, the values, if I, I do values with this church, one of the values that often come up in churches. When we do negative values, is risk aversion. In other words, we play it safe. I would say of all the churches, I've, uh, I've done these seminars in, in probably 30, 40 churches, that comment about what is kind of helpful in what we do at the moment, the negative value, risk aversion is probably there 80% of the time. Playing safe is the nature, by default, by the of many churches. I was chatting with Judy the other week and she made a comment and you just said, of all the organisations on the planet, <coughs> we should not be displaying an aversion to risk. We, we are empowered by the creator of the universe who said, I'll build my church and I won't stand against it. I will supply every need you, you need to do my will. You can't, you can fail, but you can never be a failure. And he forgives us every time we come back. I mean, we should be the most out there, edgy, risk-taking institution on the planet. 
and some things happen that the majority of churches slip back into risk of losing. <coughs> they might not get on my own pocketbooks here. I don't want us to pray in this way and at the end of the day go, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough energy, we don't have enough people, we don't have almost the people that come out of our off from our knees, so to speak, going, we are committed to what God has called us to do. And we don't know how we'll pay for it, we don't know how it will happen, we don't know, we don't guarantee the success. But we're either going to see a miracle or a spectacular failure. That gets me really going. I'm not playing a sack. I'd rather fail trying to do something with significance than succeed in that. And when we talk about a prayer culture, prayer draws us back to these patterns. Can you see why this is so foundation? Let's read the last slide up. Or second last one. <clears throat> How do we do it? Um, the phrase that I have is putting prayer at the front end. One of the default things that happens at church is we pray a couple of times during service, or we have a leaders meeting, or we have some kind of meeting, and we what they call bookend prayers. We pray to begin with and we pray at the end. And we do a, a, a leadership meeting, uh, which I'm afraid this culture, we do a leadership meeting that is about an hour and a half of talking and five minutes of praying. And we're going, haven't we got to balance something somewhere wrong? Or in, uh, in, in church meetings, or whatever we're doing, when we're, start, when we're planning out for a youth ministry or for a women's ministry or whatever that is, how much prayer goes into that? So one of the things that we will be using and we continue to use the, the Keeping Connected, it's not just a newsletter. It's an invitation for the church to be praying about the things we're confronting, we don't have answers. We often put it, stuff out in the, the newsletter that we don't know how it's going to work out. We don't know the answer. We're not trying to sell you something. We're trying to invite you to pray about the challenges that we as leaders are wrestling with. So the first thing I want to do is challenge you to look at that as a prayer letter rather than an information sheet. Now we've got stuff like the uh, the, the, the email prayer team, uh, which is great. Uh, I turned around that board, we had last week's prayer requests. Some of them have been answered miraculously. the case on Hastings is one. So uh, the next thing is expect to pray. Expect that that will be part of our culture. And we will look at ways of increasing that in the life of the church. And the other thing is expect results. Because I'm not sure what prayer is if we don't expect God to do anything. I've, my sneaking suspicion is it's routine or it's in that place of growth where you go, Lord, I can't see how this will work, but I'm going to speak out the words in faith. So expect to pray and expect results. Determined to be a prayerful person. We will never become a prayerful church through a program or a meeting. It only happens when we as individuals raise up and become prayerful people. Hold one another accountable in prayer and speak it out in faith. So me, when I talk about the, uh, the type of culture that I long for, I'm not trying to make this church into my dream. But as I listen and as we as leaders listen to God and go, what's your heart be? And we believe that he's saying, I want you to be the people of me. And we speak it out because that's where we're going. Whether it's easy or whether it's hard, that's the journey we're on. Uh, the other thing is, um, you may have seen this before, I don't know whether I'll get, uh, I don't know how to do that. I'll just put it out there. It's called a herd of rack of prayer. 50 different things you could try that you probably haven't tried before, or some of you probably won't, won't have tried. And if you're kind of thinking, well, I want to do something, but I'm not sure, you've got 50 different options, and if you did that this week, the whole level of prayer in our church, if every person here did one new thing in prayer, 
What an amazing thing. We prayed for an hour in two minutes this morning. What would it be like if 30, 40, 50 people did one more thing for me this week? I think that would be a good thing. And then there is the great prophet Micah who says this, our last slide. <laughs> Okay. If you don't know, the Nike, um, or Nike uh, brand logo was just do it. I don't think they were talking about prayer, but I can't think of a better way to actually say at the end of the day, we can talk about it and preach on it, but not in a sermon. <clears throat> but if at some stage we don't try, well, we just waste the morning for, for a half an hour or whatever. So that's part of the journey that I believe that God has on. That if we're going to be devoted to Jesus Christ and honour him as Lord, then we need to lay a foundation. And often it doesn't look spectacular, just like our house. It was expensive, it was involved, it took longer than we expected, but if to build something of significance in church life that's not done on a foundation of prayer, it's usually done on arrogance or to the level of our human capacity. And I don't know about you, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to be part of something that transcends human ability. I hope that God does things in our church that when other people look in, they go, it just doesn't make sense. They're not that big, they're not that good, they're not that talented, they're not that smart. We're ahead of the pack on that, okay? Because when God does amazing things through that, guess who gets the glory? Not us. He does. That's the kind of church I want to be part of. That's the kind of church I believe God has got us to be the very foundation.